Uh, as a bright child, he'd been selected by the Duke of Württemberg for a school in the town, which was very autocratic. Those pupils were treated like prisoners. So in lots of ways, the play, which is written in secret while he was at school, is very much a sort of act of teenage rebellion, sort of Sturm and Drang sticking it to the man. But because the play made him famous and dealt with tyranny, it also wound him up in prison. The traditions of chivalrous romance and Greek classical antiquity inspired much of Schiller's work. Now, not everyone who comes to Germany will be able to bring things to life in quite this way, but I'm lucky enough to have actor Bernd Langer perform one of Schiller's ballads for me. Friedrich Schiller, der Handschuh. Vor seinem Löwengarten das Kampfspiel zu erwarten, saß König Franz. Und um ihn die Großen der Krone und rings auf hohem Balkone die Damen in schönem Kranz. Und wie er winkt mit dem Finger, auftut sich der weite Zwinger und hinein mit bedächtigem Schritt ein Löwe tritt. Der sieht sich stumm ringsum mit langem Gähnen und schüttelt die Mähnen und streckt die Glieder und legt sich nieder. Da fällt von des Altans Rand ein Handschuh von schöner Hand zwischen den Tiger und den Leuen mitten hinein. Und zu Ritter de Lorges spottender Weiß wendet sich Fräulein Kunigund. Herr Ritter, ist eure Lieb so heiß, wie ihr mir schwört zu jeder Stund? Ei, so hebt mir den Handschuh auf. Und der Ritter an schnellem Lauf steigt hinab in den furchtbaren Zwinger mit festem Schritte und aus der ungeheuer Mitte nimmt er den Handschuh mit keckem Finger. Da schallt ihm sein Lob aus jedem Munde. Aber mit zärtlichem Liebesblick, er verheißt ihm sein nahes Glück, empfängt ihn Fräulein Kunigunde. Und er wirft ihr den Handschuh ins Gesicht. Den Dank, Dame, begehr ich nicht und verlässt sie zur selben Stunde. This ballad is a chivalric tale with a twist. As Schiller takes a popular ballad form, a story about knights and kings and ladies, and, and makes an enlightenment point about power in the individual as the knight throws the glove back in the lady's face. It's almost like a punchline to a joke. Schiller remained in Weimar until his death at 45 from tuberculosis. A hundred years later, another extraordinary thinker would seek inspiration from the Weimar greats. His name was Friedrich Nietzsche. He was a controversial figure who rejected God and refused to be anyone's disciple. But he took inspiration from Schiller and Goethe. But Nietzsche was a figure mired in controversy because his work was appropriated by the Nazis. But he's still incredibly compelling. I found that the house he grew up in still stands in the small town of Rocken, so I'm on my way there now. Nietzsche strikes a really lonely figure. He wasn't what you'd call a people person. At one point he said, there's no one alive or dead I feel I can talk to. He had real problems with relationships with women as well. At one point, he and a friend were both interested in the same woman and Nietzsche stepped aside and allowed his friend to pursue the relationship. If he felt the need, he'd resort to prostitutes, but he was really a very lonely man. But maybe it's precisely this loneliness and isolation that sets Nietzsche apart. By not coming into contact with other people and other ideas, he was able to be a true original. It might seem like I'm determined to spend part of my journey rifling through other people's homes, Welcome to Friedrich Nietzsche's birthplace. But in fact, I had many questions to ask the current pastor about Nietzsche's complicated relationship with the church. Come in. Welcome to Friedrich Nietzsche's birth house. Thank you. And Nietzsche, uh, who f famously did, uh, said that God, God is dead, didn't he? He was the son of a pastor. That's an ironic thing, do you think? Um. <laughs> it was, I'm asking the wrong person, maybe. <laughs> it, it was. The interview didn't go quite the way I'd planned, yeah. right, okay. so I tried again. Um, it, it strikes me as interesting that Nietzsche, who is, is so famous for being against religion, should be the son of a pastor and come from a pastor's house. Is, is that ironic, do you think? Oh, I, I don't think so. He was the son of a pastor here, and... Uh, 
his opinion uh, changed in, in later times uh, when he was a student. Right. He uh, knows the uh, Bible very well when he was a little boy. Yeah, yeah. Yes, later. Yeah, later. I realised I wasn't going to get much more from him, so I decided to explore the graveyard myself. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. Thank Goodbye. You. Thank Welcome you. later. Thank you very much. Goodbye. It seems ironic that Nietzsche is buried in the shadow of the church where his father was pastor. With his philosophy, he rejected religion outright. He said that God was dead. Next to him is his sister Elizabeth, who's largely responsible for Nietzsche's work being associated with the Nazis. Which is a double irony, because what he was really interested in was freedom in all its forms, especially from tyranny. Nietzsche was a complicated man, but his message was pretty simple. He wants us to think again. He described his book Will to Power as a book for thinking and nothing more. What he asks us to do is take one step back and in doing so, reevaluate everything. Whilst I re-evaluated everything, the miles passed on the way to my next stop. Nietzsche is a giant of popular German culture, and another is Wagner. He's most famous nowadays, probably, for the soundtrack to Apocalypse Now. I love the smell of Wagner in the morning, which is why I've come to Bayreuth, home of all things Wagner. Nietzsche drew inspiration from Goethe and Schiller and their belief that art offered the path to pure happiness. But one contemporary really captured his imagination, Richard Wagner. He was so inspired by Wagner, he wrote a book for him called Birth of a Tragedy. He said, over our sky no cloud ever passed. He saw Wagner as the saviour of German art. Nietzsche and Wagner believed in the redemptive power of tragedy, tragedy in its classical dramatic sense. They believed that by depicting the agony of existence through art, it turned into something beautiful and made life more bearable. So what made Wagner's brand of opera different? Well, he was interested in synthesizing all of the arts into one unified whole, theater, stage design, music, literature, and drama into what he called Gesamtkunstwerk, total artwork. Wagner believed that myths provided the most fitting stories. He adapted Germanic legends, medieval poetry, Nordic mythology, Grimm's fairy tales with the political upheavals of his time and created an almost cinematic modern art form. But of these elements, music held the supreme role. I'm not sure if the visit to Wagner's house actually tells me a lot about the man, to be honest. It feels like one of those places that's been preserved in aspic as a sort of odd time capsule. And I wonder how much of the man still really resides there. I've been welcomed to one of the largest and most splendid theatres in Europe, the McGraveal Theatre. Like in Weimar, art lovers and patrons reigned over Bayreuth. The town reached its zenith under Wilhelmina, sister of the Prussian king, Frederick the Great. In the 18th century, Germany was like a patchwork quilt of cities, states and kingdoms. One of the main players was Frederick the Great in Prussia, building the modern city-state in Berlin, becoming an actor on the world stage. His sister, Wilhelmina, was trapped in an unhappy marriage here in Bayreuth. Ostracised by the locals, she turned her energy to turning Bayreuth into one of the biggest cultural centres in Germany and built this theatre, demonstrating her generosity and love of culture and at the same time giving expression to her obsession with status. Designed in 1747 by Giuseppe Galibibiena, the most celebrated theatre architect of the day, it's a miracle that this wooden theatre has survived completely intact. This opera house is a large theatre for when it was built, but it's all about hierarchy in here. It's all about status. The best seats in the house are the lowest, and the royal box is there in the centre of the room, dominating the entire space. It's almost as though the stage is an afterthought. You do really get the feeling that when you came to see a show here, you weren't supposed to look at the stage, but at the nobility at the other end of the room. Wilhelmina wrote plays and composed short operas herself. She regularly dressed up as a shepherdess as well, a poetic disguise in which she could escape from the formality of everyday life in the court. Italian operas, pastoral plays and French drama would have been played here. But you know what? I fancy a little bit of 18th century stand-up. What do you reckon? 
Anyone in from Prussia? Go, cool, you can't trust Austrians, can you? What about the Elector of Hanover? Oh dear, what a fuss that was, eh? <laughs> Well, I'm more than halfway through my German cultural odyssey and uh, I've learned all sorts of things and discovered all sorts of stuff about Germany I never knew before. But what do the Germans think of us? Well, actually, they quite like us, incredibly. And all over Germany, there are Anglo-German friendship clubs, dining societies. Now, I'm in Bayreuth and I'm at the uh, Hotel Gordoner Anker, where an Anglo-German society is having a dinner and they've invited me to join them. Let's go and find out what they think of us face to face. Although the Germans like us, we're still a bit standoffish towards everything that's German, aren't we? The whole reason for undertaking this journey in the first place. Hello, good evening. I was a bit nervous, and in good British fashion, I was gagging for a beer. Thanks very much. Hi, El. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. But no one was offering, so I had to ask, didn't I? Well, thanks for having me. Can I have a drink? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> Here's my beer. Oh, it's, oh, it's just not big enough, is it? Crikey. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. No, 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 it's fine. No, no, it's fine. Well, cheers. Okay, cheers. 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 Are there lots of Anglo-German society? There are many, yes. They're uh, everywhere, are they? in, in Nuremberg, in Munich. There is an Anglo-German society in Southampton as is well. There? There is one, and, and this one here, yeah. so she very is good. very Anglophile every, every year. Every year for 17 years now, I spend my whole summer holidays in England and Scotland. Wow. What is it? What's the appeal? Tradition. Castles, gardens, ruins, everything. You see, because oh. we've come to Germany and looked at uh, tradition, castles, gardens and ruins, <laughs> and you've got lots as well, so it's interesting yeah. you should like well, ours. Well, not, not that much. What are your hopes and aspirations for Anglo-German relations? What, what do you, what's your dream? Uh, we are working for a British twinning. I mean, Bayreuth is a beautiful town, and what we would like to have is a British twinning. So what we what we like is something we don't have over here. So okay, so you'd like a seaside, seaside a twinning town. with a seaside yeah. town. I mean, well, I, I'll return to the UK and find if there are any vacancies for you. I'll see what I can yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do you like this beer? I like the beer. I like all the beer, actually. We've had, okay. we've had lots but why do the Germans feel such affinity towards the Brits? Partly because, like us, they love tradition, but feel that there's a whole chapter of their own history that they can't talk about. So by celebrating all that is British, they're feeding their appetite for the past. In some ways, both the Brits and Germans have been unable to let go of recent events. Bismarck said of the British, they do not want to be loved. Maybe you can apply that in reverse and say about the Germans, all they want is to be loved. <laughs> Bavarian tennis balls. <laughs> There's no better place to explore the changing relations between Britain and the Germans than in a boat on the Rhine Valley. For most of the 19th century, relations between Britain and Germany were really very good. We had a great deal in common, both culturally and politically. British audiences loved German music, Haydn, Mozart, Mendelssohn. Uh, British writers like Byron and Keats and Coleridge admired the work of Goethe and Schiller. And then there was the politics. We shared common enemies, France and Russia. Our royal family was even German. So what on earth went wrong? Because Germany is a landlocked country, its rivers are incredibly important, and none more so than the Rhine. This mighty, navigable river runs from the top to the bottom of the western part of Germany. It's a frontier, but it's more than that. It's crucially important. It has iron ore and coal. Whoever controls the Rhine has ascendancy in Western Europe. Following the Franco-Prussian War, Germany took over Alsace-Lorraine on the French side of the Rhine. By adding the iron of Lorraine to their vast coal and iron resources, Germany was to become the powerhouse of European industrialization. Iron and steel became the instruments for Prussian domination, Germany's greatness in the aggression which lay behind the two world wars. With Germany gaining control of the Rhine and the iron ore and coal resources there, she was well on her way to becoming a predominant European continental power and a strong industrial competitor to Great Britain. This meant that sooner or later, a clash of some kind was inevitable. The Rhine, of course, is essential to trade, but there's more to it than just iron ore and coal. With its castles and incredible vistas, the Rhine is an invitation to Germany's mythical and romantic past. I expect plenty more romanticism as I journey further south. But 
there'd be no romance without wine, would there? <laughs>